So I guess the other thing about peace that I have really worried about is this idea of compromise. And I think, you know, when we have this saying, we agree to disagree, I hate that saying. Um, because to me, that's, that's just where you, that's where you gave up and you said, we're not able to take this to a different level. We're going to stay in our script and I'm not going to change mine and you're not going to change yours, which means neither one of us learned anything. But what happens when there's real mutual learning is that it's not a compromise. It's that everybody actually perceives something in a way they hadn't perceived it before. So it isn't that I perceive that you were right all along. And so I come over to your way of thinking. No, it's that we both perceive something in each other's thinking and that opens up something new. And then we're both in another place. So, so I think that for me, that's a big mistake is to, to think that compromise is about relinquishing your attachment to your own idea so that you can adopt someone else's. That's not going anywhere good. Well, I, I think one thing that I have noticed with the work that I've been doing with warm data is that this process engages people to talk about their personal lives or personal explorations throughout multiple contexts. So you have a question like what's essential or what's being revealed or what's health. And then people get in conversations and they move around through multiple contexts, through the context of history or economy or politics or technology or education or family or right, religion. And as this happens, um, they start to perceive the interdependency in another way. So that those scripts that they came into the room with that were so solid and analyzed and backed up and well thought out and totally rehearsed and, and, and overperformed, um, they, they get left behind. And what comes out is people's expression of their own lives through multiple contexts. So I don't take on the question where the polarity is. I move into a space of a condition of relational conversation where the group of people can actually explore interdependency. And, and I'm saying that it sounds very dry. It's not dry. People are talking, they're telling stories, they're talking about, you know, all sorts of things. You never know what people are going to talk about, what's going to come out. They and And so because it's not structured at that level, there's no manipulation, there's no way to be right or wrong. There is no proving or defending or or, 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 you know, taking a stand for something. It's sort of like for an hour and a half, people get to kind of move around in just this transcontextual overlapping of ideas and stories. And by the end of it, the group as a whole is in a very different set of relationships and ways of communicating and ways of thinking. And if you ask that group after that hour and a half, what should we do about the education system? They are not going to say, let's change the curriculum, right? They are going to say, ah, let's think about culture. Let's talk with, you know, parents about how to think about, you know, what is identity for the next generation going to be living in a world that's changing. They're in a totally different set of questions and so I think where we get into the 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 deepest trouble is in trying to pick apart and solve what we have considered the problems 
in what I would call the first order. This is the problem. This is a solution. What's the strategy to get to the solution? And the problem is not the problem. The problem is a consequence of many relationships that made other relationships that manifested in business deals or the, the architecture of a school or how someone got married or what kind of ceremony they had or if they lived in poverty or if they were deemed crazy or criminal or, you know, there's so much that is behind these things that is not really visible when you're distracted looking at the the polarity so the polarity can get identified as an event and if you try to solve it at that level it just actually makes more consequences so my work is really about working with groups of people and allowing them to get a shift in their perception, a shift, and that shift in perception shifts their attitude about life. So, you know, I'm not saying to people, after this, you should go and you should change your country and you should change. I'm like, after this, go home and see how you interact with your kids. See what you see in your partner. See how you are thinking about, you know, your own identity, your own life, your body, the ground you're standing on. And people go home and they, they you know, a couple of days later, they send an email. Hey, guess what? I, I quit smoking or I called my sister I haven't talked to in 12 years or I, or I was in a room and we were about to start a project and I saw a context that I had never seen before. But by then, they've left the warm data work days before. And this thing has kind of cooked in them and moved through their lives. And, and they're, you know, maybe they're treating their children a little differently. And maybe their children then go to school and treat the other children a little differently. And so I'm interested in how change happens, not in the first order but in the second, third, fourth, the deep, deeper orders, far away, so that whoever it is that's actually receiving the benefit of the warm data never even knew it happened. Because it was a friend of a friend of a friend or a colleague or, you know, how it got to them is beyond me. But that's how nature is, right? There's not first order solutions. So I think I think one of the things we get into trouble with is if you think peace is a thing, you can try to get it and grasp it and make it and achieve it and measure it and make it into a goal. And if you think of it as a whole set of relationships that are relationing, an ecology, think of peace as an ecology. That it isn't a static thing you can get. Um, then the question is, what kind of relationships can you make in the minutia of the day that change the attitude of the system, change the tonality, uh, change the atmosphere, change the feeling, change the logic of what it's possible to say and who it's possible to be? So warm data, there's a, is a definition, but warm data is the um, it's the the information that's in the in between of the contexts, right? So um, there's a a friend of mine, Robert, who had this great description of it. He said, you know, we always talk about that story with the elephant and the mice and the mice that, you know, one goes to the tail and it's a rope and the trunk and it's a snake and the ears and it's a fan, right? But, and each one has their own perception, but the real story there is what's the relationship between the mice? How are the mice, a, what's their, what are, how do they get along? What kind of, what, when they go back to have a beer together, what, what are they talking about? What is their vibe? 
And in a way, that's the warm data, right? So it's everybody has their own perceptions, of course. But what's interesting is how they're in relationship, right? So the the problems with education or with healthcare or with all of these things that we could identify as problem sources is not in that thing because that thing is a is is producing is expressing in the relationship of all the other contexts right education is an expression of economy and culture and family and 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 identity and you know all sorts of things it isn't really a thing in itself it's a thing that is the product of lots of reflections of other things and we try to grab that reflection and produce change in it but it's those relationships that are in the warm data that's the warm data so you know you meet someone and you say hi and it's the first time you've met them and in the old days we used to shake their hand and you would look in their eyes and they would tell you their name and it was like they were suddenly the volume got turned off right what's your name <laughs> and it's that sense that you weren't actually paying attention to the name you were paying attention to the other information which had something to do with how does my person be in relationship with this person which is a much more significant question than the name the name is one kind of data but how do you be in relationship with them which is like in the way they're holding their body and the way they're using their voice and the focus of their eyes in the gesture of their smile in the in what they're wearing and how they smell and how they right there's a whole lot of things happening in that moment someone is telling you their name and no wonder we never remember anybody's <laughs> name <laughs> so, so that's warm data and uh, then the script okay the script the script is i talk about scripts so much that it's actually becoming a script um, the script is is uh, uh, what you're used to saying, what you think you're supposed to say, what it is to, you know, when you are sitting down with a group of people and someone talks about politics and each person, you know, how many conversations have you had about politics where anybody actually said anything new? They're all on script, right? You know what they're going to say. They're just producing the thing that they have produced. They've taken a position. It's rehearsed. It's not mutual learning. It's not, it's not improvisation. It's not spontaneous learning. It's not alive. It's a script. The benefit of scripts is that they hold the expertise and the research and the depth of experience. And what you lose in the script is the possibility to see things in another way, a way that you haven't before. So, so um, it's very, very difficult to tell whether your observations are actually your observations or whether your observations have been predetermined by the kind of cultural epistemological patterns that you have been within. And um, how do you know? How would you know? Like when we look at nature and we say it's regenerative, nature's not considering itself regenerative. A tree does not call itself a tree. So we're only able to perceive trees and natures through through our own set of, of patterns. And language is a big part of that. So we have the limitations, the filters, the pre-existing, mostly mechanistic notions that are under there. And then without knowing it, we project them everywhere. So the problem with scripts is that they bring that in. They bring in the history of of thinking from the past, which may or may not be right, or whether it's right or wrong is not in question. That's just irrelevant. 
what's what's important is to be able to unearth insights that are in in the underground that are that are in the soil that are in the space between you and me that we haven't found yet Mm, that's a that's going to depend on who you ask. Um, my sister used to say about cybernetics that cybernetics makes poets out of us. But a lot of people wouldn't agree with that. A lot of people would say that cybernetics is inherently mechanistic. And um, I would say both are true. <laughs> um, so... The important thing about cybernetics is that that historically it that that was the beginning of Western science being able to think about things in a nonlinear way and to really take on um, the the possibilities of how relationships and processes were were actually producing how a system could maintain its integrity. Um, so cybernetics is important in, in that sense, that there is a, a way of looking at how multiple processes come together to form something. And, and that's a big shift from a simple hammer and a nail idea. So you can, you know, you can fix your truck if you open the hood and you change the distributor cap. But you can't fix a family like that. And, and this, this is where it, it depends on whose cybernetics you're playing with because there's a lot of different flavors. Um, I prefer the flavors that are more interested in how living processes are producing living processes. Um, but uh, so the good news with cybernetics is that it opens up the possibility of multiplicity, multiple perspectives, um, and and looking at the 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 complex dynamics in which something comes to be. The downside is that if you look at cybernetics and you're already prone to mechanistic thinking, you can actually turn it back into a machine, right? So very often I see colleagues working in the field of complexity um, and they take on some subject, I don't know, the education system of some country or the healthcare or the, you know, a political piece or something. And they know that it's not singular, that it requires the multiplicity, um, but they don't go deep enough. So there's a kind of flat cybernetics or flat complexity that you can create accidentally if you try to make a methodology out of it. So, I would say the cybernetics that you're working with is only as viable as the observer. And of course, this the first rule of second order cybernetics is to observe the observer. So what is it? How is the observer observing? And if that observer is you, you already have all sorts of filters and experiences and processes and life behind you that are going to make it so that you can perceive some things in their nuance and you can't perceive other things at all. So it, it's not as though the observer can just observe what's there ever. There's always going to be a particular unique filtration and limitation process. And it's not static, okay? Your limitations and filtrations today are different tomorrow. So just because you observed it doesn't mean that's how you're going to observe it tomorrow. 
so you have to be really careful with this. And, and I'm saying that because I see a lot of people who aren't. And they try to use systems or complexity or cybernetics in ways that are going to be um, tools to extract a particular outcome. And the hope is that that tool will extract that particular outcome um, with more depth and it'll be more complex. And I'm not altogether sure that that is a, a good approach. Um, what's interesting for me about those processes is actually to change the approach. Why are you looking for outcomes and, and methodologies and tools? What we're actually looking for is how do we recognize with some nuance the relational processes we are within and respond to them differently, but that's a completely spontaneous process. So the second you use it to create something that is um, non-spontaneous, you're going to get into trouble because you're going back into a mechanistic first order type of, of solutioning. The first thing is that there's a, a kind of reaching for a particular sort of solution. And we see it now with the pandemic, right? Let's go back. We want to go back to before this happened, or we want to somehow, you know, heal the limb so it's like it was before. And I, I, I just don't think that's possible. So without really holding those interdependencies that are existing with all those stakeholders that are benefiting, okay, and their benefits are necessary for other people's benefits, which are necessary for other people's benefits, right? It doesn't just stop at the first round of stakeholders. It keeps going and going. It's all the way down to your blue jeans that you're wearing right now, right? It's, it has something to do with, you know, who makes the parts in the bus you take across town. So we can't actually, um, and this will be frustrating to hear, but in some sense, that ability to perceive those contexts is very healing. Because it takes the, the trauma, the pain that is so personal and allows the learning to, about it to be to, to perceive all the different ways in which this system that, that we are all in is creating this. Now, that may seem insignificant, but I would say that it's not. That even the beginnings of perceiving the, the, you know, the horrible things that have happened to families through, other, through that interdependency changes the response. Um, so the other thing that I would say about using cybernetics or systems processes for working with situations like Afghanistan or other areas of high conflict um, is that most of the time that polarity that is there is, is held in place by removing other con contextual information. Okay, this is something that I have learned about, about conflict, is that it requires that contextual information be removed. Once you start to put that contextual information back in, people see things differently.
Yeah, let me just give one that's sort of close to home. So, um, you know, you might perceive, for example, that your neighbor is mean and is un is is stingy, and that they, you know, they're always doing things that are they're threatening to sue you for your tree that's putting apples on their lawn, and they're right, and so you have a conflict with them. And then you start to learn from them that what their history is, how their family is, how they came to that piece of how they live in that house, what's happening in their lives. And suddenly that conflict that you're in is very different. And they start to see from your position, you know, not necessarily, it's not about the tree or the land or the conflict. It's about, it's about allowing the complexity of the situation to be perceived and in that in that sharing it becomes very difficult then to return to the polarity of the tree but if you start with the tree and say we have to come up with a solution to this tree problem um you're gonna be you know making toothpicks of that tree and, and each other. So one of the, I mean, this coming back to this thing, it, it, it's, this is why you want to go to a different context. And I would say contexts when you're in dealing with conflict, because the, the, the scripts that exist in the actual conflict are too grooved in. You can't get into new understanding by just going over the same script over and over again. But when you go into different contextual territories and allow other experiences and ways of knowing and, and, and uh, attitudes and so on to come out, histories and processes, very, very different approaches come out. And then there's a relationship. And from the relationship, then something else can take place. And at, at that point, still, I would never go back to the tree question. I would just let that sort itself out. It's like Buckminster Fuller said, you don't solve the problems. You, you know, change the situation and let the problems solve themselves. <laughs>